Okay, so um, today I want to talk about primarily um, the difference between global and, and local symmetry, or well known as gauge symmetry. Um, and in particular, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the different types of symmetries that we will encounter. Um, Taking it as classifying symmetry types that maybe a little bit. Uh, there is a great definitely, you know, some deep mathematics and classifying symmetry. That's not what I mean. I'm, I'm doing something very um, But it, it is important because it will help us to um, recognize the type of symmetry that we're dealing with. <clears throat> and in particular, one of these symmetries that I want to focus on for some part of today is um, self symmetry uh, or global symmetries. Um, we've talked a little bit about them so far, but I want to clarify some points about them. Um, and these global symmetries are otherwise known as gauge symmetries. And um, we'll talk a little bit about why the case and why we care. Um, and then hopefully by the end of this lecture, I will get to stating. Uh, know this theorem in a slightly more precise way than we've actually seen. And then um, on Friday's lecture, we'll, we'll prove um, the classical version of know this theorem. I should say that know this theorem itself is a classical theorem. Um, there is a quantum version of this, but what it is um, will take some elaboration. So we'll talk a little bit about. Um, how to think about things like the euler lagrange equations kind of in a quantum setting. They mean something slightly different. They're statements about correlation functions in theory, uh, and they give you constraints on correlation functions. So we, on Friday, we'll talk about the schrodinger dyson equation, and um, in particular, the water entities that are located to the quantum version of the nervous theory. <coughs> okay. So, quantum field theory doesn't strictly need symmetries in order to make sense. It's perfectly sensible um, without expanding on, on the idea of symmetries. However, understanding symmetries um, <clears throat> certainly helps us organize quantum field theories um, a little bit more. So, it's worth our spending some time. Um, Talking about the different types of symmetries that we might encounter um, in studying quantum field theory, and in particular, homology. So, Q of T does not really need symmetries, but they do. Help in organizing and restricting some of the theories that we're allowed to study. So, to that end, let's talk about the types of symmetries that we might encounter. We've seen pretty much all of them so far. And um, what I want to do now is kind of just elaborate a little bit on, on these things and, and put it in a formal setting so that we can say, well, this is what it is. So the first set of symmetries are the speed symmetry. As the name this um, would indicate, discrete symmetries describe non-continuous changes in a system. For example, if I take a square and 
then a square has a discrete rotational symmetry because if I rotate a square by zero degrees or pi by two or p pi by two, two pi, then I get something that looks like I haven't made any change. But if I rotate it by any other angles, then it looks like I have made change. You can tell the difference. So it's only if I rotate the square by multiple of pi by two that I find that I produce an object that looks unchanged. So the symmetries of the square, um, so the square has rotational symmetry. A square as the speed rotational symmetry The group of equations has four elements. These are the identity rotations. By by two, I and B by by two. Because there's four elements, we say that the order of this group is four. And in fact, it's the general theory that the symmetry group of any discrete rotator uh, symmetry are all five order. Okay. So we say that order of this is four. And more generally, Um, the sweet symmetries are all of finite order. Let's be contrasted with the second case, which is continuous symmetries. Continuous symmetries describe a continuum of changes that we can make to a system that leave it invariant. Yeah, some of these are sometimes also called V symmetries. 
groups that they correspond to um, have a particular structure, the structure of uh, lead groups. And an example of this is so. A rotating circle by any angle theta between zero and two pi it leaves the circle very high. And we say that the symmetry group is U1, which is the set of all objects that look like the I of theta with theta between zero and zero. Uh, and you want to leave it, this is the lead symmetry, and the parameter, the parameter of this symmetry is the continuous parameter theta. So these are these are discrete symmetries, but the continuous. And if you remember what I said when I started off the section on the other theorem, every continuous global symmetry corresponds to a, a zone law. Okay, so it's this type of symmetry that we associate with another sphere and not this type of symmetry. So for example, um, certain systems are invariant if I exchange their spatial coordinates with minus their spatial coordinates with the parity transformation, parity transformation like the screen transformation, but that's um, time inversion symmetry, t to minus t. By discrete transformations, hard inversion symmetry, um, by discrete inversion, uh, uh, discrete transformation, none of those correspond to conservation laws. So those don't fall in the category of things to provide a nervous scale. Okay. Yeah. On the topic of nervous there, the other thing that showed up in that uh, context was. Uh, I think for the one more thing. Yeah, you've seen this before. Uh, Inter are some are some trees that transform the fields in a theory. I'm stating everything in this one day field theory. They transform fields into other fields. So internal symmetries uh, transform. Um, heels into other fields without any reference to their big time location. For example, example that we've seen before um, is the slight phase rotations of the top landscape. So phase rotations. Phase complex field.
under which by complex goes to the front of x is related to the of x and used to be by alpha say um by of x and by conjugate of x goes to by prime conjugate of x minus by alpha the key point here is that these are the same space time fact. Okay. So this is the same space time point. So I don't lose any information if I just drop off any dependent Okay. So that's what I mean by internal space. The act in the space in which the body is in. Notice also that this guy alpha here, it's some continuous real number, which means that these phase rotations are an example of continuous um, that are in the flow. So this should be contrasted with space time series. Space time symmetries mix fields living at different space time points. For example, <clears throat> under a space time translation, it's me going to X new plus a non constant a the field phi which depends on x will go to the field phi prime of x which is equal to phi of x prime phi of x plus a we talk about it. The point here is that this guy is assigned in a different space time zone than the original one. Okay, and so what we find is that the transform field is the same as the original field, but evaluated in space time. Okay, so Another example of um, space time symmetry on Lorentz transformations, for example. Okay, they act on the coordinates of space time and take you between different initial reference terms. And that mixes up the fields um, at different points in the space time. Um, where are we? Okay, so now this brings us to um, global versus local. So, global symmetry. 
And the same way at all points in space. Now. So, for example, the space rotation that we talked about here, the action of the phase rotation is parameterized by the parameter alpha, and alpha has no space time dependence. You can directly all of the, the fields in the same way, independent of where they are in space. Right? So, global subfields um, act the same way. At all points in the space time. So if I make a phase change here on Earth, it's the same phase change that you will find taking place in Mars. Okay. On the other hand, Local symmetries act um, locally at a particular point in space. Okay. For example, if I take the same um, phase rotation, I may alpha depend on x, now I'm talking about x, um, part of x, and Prime of x equal to minus prime of x which is by star of x. This defines the local, and if the theory is still invariant under uh, this change, then this defines a local symmetry. So this is a local um, transformation. Local approximation. That's positive e to a local subject. Right. So, in the example that we used in class in previous times of the three complex um, scalar, where we made this local transformation, we found that it did not lead to a local symmetry. There were terms that we needed to find a way of getting rid of. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this difference between a local and a global symmetry might seem fairly innocuous. Okay, all we're doing is making the parameter a function of the location in space time. Sorry. But it turns out that it is not. In fact, it is a remarkably deep statement. Okay. And it's something that, I, that we should probably discuss a little bit more because we will encounter it, uh, encounter it many times. In what's to come. And in fact, you know, one reason to spend that time talking about it and elaborating on this is that so much of modern physics depends on the idea of these local or gauge structures. Okay. So <clears throat> the upshot is the following global symmetries actually reflect some invariance of the laws of physics. Okay. In the following step, acting with a non trivial global symmetry on a theory, um, sorry, acting on a, 
um, on a symmetric theory with a non trivial global transformation, global symmetry transformation, on some state in a Hilbert space, produces a new distinct state in a Hilbert space. Okay, so global symmetries. Correspond to um, invariances in the laws of nature and produce in the state space and Local or gauge symmetries, on the other hand, do not produce new states in the space. In fact, they don't even correspond to any um, conserved quantities. Local symmetries or gauge symmetries are a reflection of our redundancy in the description of a particular system. So here's the example that we started off with. Right. Remember we talked about the pen and that it had rotational symmetry above the vertical axis? So if I said close your eyes and I made a rotation and said open your eyes, you'd be able to tell that I made a difference. Right. So now we'll get to this statement a little bit later, but this state of the pen is not as low as energy state. Okay. If I leave it alone, then quantum fluctuations will destabilize it and it'll fall to its lowest energy state. Right? So it, it picks one depending on any number of different things um, at the time air currents, temperature fluctuations, quantum fluctuations, whatever. It picks a lowest energy state and it falls to that lowest energy state. Okay. Now, if I said, close your eyes, and I make the same rotation that I made, right? open your eyes, and you can tell that it's different. Okay. This is still a lowest energy state. It's not a new state in the middle space of the, of the head. Okay. It's the same state. There's a degeneracy in the way I describe this. There's a, there's a, there's a redundancy in my description of the system. Basically, any one of the infinite number of states, right? This, 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 this can be reached by making the same rotation. Technically, we say that the rotation, the, the rotation symmetry of the pen um, was broken, um, and the vacuum, the lowest energy state, doesn't display the same um, symmetry. And we'll come to symmetry breaking a little later. But for the moment, I want you to recognize that um, this system has an enormous redundancy. Okay. And that comes with rotating this pen in its lowest energy state. I'm not getting new states. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to make this a little bit more precise now. So it's a little bit difficult to describe this thing, to describe this, this pen now. However, one system that does display the canonical system display the local or gain variance is electromagnetic. So well, let's consider electromagnetism. Classical electromagnetism. Local or gauge. Symmetries and code the dynasties.
So in fact, it turns out that these also don't fit into the category of things described by uh, this theory. Okay, so if I have a global continuous symmetry, then I can associate this global continuous symmetry with some conservation model, some conserved character. Okay? But if I have a local symmetry, there is no conserved character corresponding to this. So now let's consider classical electromagnetism. And that's called electromagnetic. The gauge symmetry, the gauge confirmation, acts on the vector tensor in a particular way. So here, the gauge confirmation, local confirmation, acts on the four vector potential. A new by taking a new of x to a new prime of x and a new prime of x is related to a new by the following way a new of x plus the derivative d new of scaling pi by the function of x. This is not arbitrary scale of that in front. Recall that in classical electric practice, the physical, that is to say, measurable quantities, not the four vector potential. I mean, okay, you could cook up something like that. I don't know, but then they don't know. Um, in classical theory, uh, in quantum, um, the classically measurable quantity things that we call voltage and amateur, things like that are, are detected is not the four vector potential, but the electric and magnetic fields that are delivered from four vector potential. So, The observables theory are um, the electric and magnetic fields. And these are E, E minus the gradient of time component of the four vector potential, you know about the scalar potential, plus time derivative, E naught, of the remaining three components, is normally called the vector. And magnetic field is the curl of the vector. So the question that you should ask is, if I make this kind of local change to the public potential, how is this affecting the electric and magnetic field? Because again, these are the measurable quantities. So let's see what happens. So under 
transformation. Goes to let's say the farm. Thanks. Which is minus radius in time, but I'm a bit of a farm. Is minus gradient a naught prime. What happens when I substitute naught in here? So this is just a naught plus t naught uh, chi base. But t naught a prime is um, a. Plus the time derivative of the right? spatial derivative of chi is the gradient of chi. Out of this, I get minus the gradient of a naught plus d naught a, and that's it. E of x. And in the remaining terms, I get minus the gradient. Of d naught pi plus d naught of the gradient of pi. These mixed derivatives are commutative, so these two terms will cancel each other out. And you can see that the electric field is unchanged by this transformation. Similarly, magnetic field d of x goes to the pi of x, which is fellow of a pi, which is the of a plus gradient of pi, the curl of a. Plus the curl of the gradient of some scale. The curl of the gradient measures how a gradient field is twisting in, in slip. And a gradient field, by definition, is one that's radially extending, so no curl. So this is zero. And again, the electric and magnetic fields are unchanged by this conservation. And because the electric and magnetic fields measure the physical state of the electromagnetic field, the statement here is that I can make this local gauge transformation and leave the physical state of the system invariant. But what the local transformations are doing, the gauge transformations are doing, is that they're telling me that they give this redundancy in how I describe the electric and magnetic fields. Right, I can add really, really the gradient of any scale. I didn't specify what this is, the, any arbitrary scale. As long as it enters its transformation this way, it won't change the physical system that you've measured. Hence, redundancy. Okay, so if local symmetries don't change the state of the physical system. And I've just made an argument for the fact that. They don't need to print it to do this here. There's no conserved quantity associated with these local summaries. How could we get here? So, the question here is why could we care about local summaries?
Well, apart from the fact that most of the universe seems to be coded in these local symmetries, which is a pretty good thing. Um, let me tell you why we should care about these local locations. The first thing is, is to understand how we build a theory. Okay, so what are we doing? What we're trying to do here as a mathematicist is build a description of the world around us. So we want to model the world around us. Right, so let's ask, how would we build a theory that is locally invariant? So what we do there is we start off with a theory that has the corresponding global invariants. So for example, if we're talking about phase rotations, right? I first start off with a theory like the theory of complex um, scalars. I write down the Lagrangian. Um, and I'm making sure that this Lagrangian is very under the global associated globals. Then I make those global symmetries local, promoting the parameter alpha with a constant to something that depends on space time. Right? And when I do that, I can no longer just take this outside of the locus. The locus is now max right? So, in addition to the terms that I'm going to cancel out nicely, the mod 5 squared terms, the uh, uh, mod 5 and 4 terms, the mod d5 terms now no longer are invariant. Right? I will get terms that will contain derivatives of this guy. Right? So, now if I insist, this is called gauging the global symmetry. Right. So when, you, when people talk about gauging a symmetry, they're talking about taking the corresponding uh, global symmetry and making it local. Okay. So now it turns out that in order to make this theory, this Lagrangian globally invariant, uh, sorry, locally invariant, okay, I have to make some improvements. I have to add some additional terms. So what terms? Well, it turns out terms, at least for the complex scalars that we're talking about here. The terms that you need to add are precisely terms like this, except instead of a chi, I'll have an alpha. So it picks for me what this arbitrary scalar is. It's not just any arbitrary scalar, it's this scalar. Okay? So let me summarize. I start off with a theory that is globally invariant. I insist, for whatever reason, that this theory must be globally invariant. I find that it is not. Right? There are terms that come that are proportional to the derivatives of this parameter. Right? But I insist that it be locally invariant. So to do that, I need to add additional terms. Which additional terms? Well, demanding local invariance severely constrains which terms I can add. In this case, I need to add a spin one field. I need to add a vector. I need to add a particular vector that transforms in a particular way. Which way? This way. Okay. So the upshot is the reason why we care about local symmetry is that they dictate the form of interactions that I have. So gauge symmetries actually tell me how the fields in my theory are allowed to interact. That's why we care about it. If I want to build a theory of, I don't know, particle physics, like the standard model of particle physics, we don't just chuck these terms in, in you know, willy nilly. They're put in because they satisfy this constraint of gauge and it dictates the types of interaction that we have. That's the moral of the story. Gauge symmetries severely strain. Of interactions that we are allowed. Okay, so then you know, now we go back and say, fine, the way we do this is we start off with theory. That is that has a global invariance, and then we gauge that global invariance. So now the immediate question should be which symmetries are we allowed to gauge? Okay. Which
or we allow to do change. So are all global symmetries fake? The answer is no. We're allowed to gauge those symmetries that are not anonymous. Only those that are not anonymous. Okay. Again, I'll come back to this um, in a little later uh, when we when we talk about the uh, formal number. Okay, so now we have all the ingredients that we need in order to state the difference theorem problem. And then next time, we'll do this. The difference theorem is in the problem. It says that for every continuous global symmetry, there exists a current JMU that is observed. So for every continuous global symmetry, there exists a current. Maybe that is fine. That's B of JMU is equal to zero. This is called the conservation of the character. Anything that satisfies the current um, relation is a conserved quantity. Corresponding to this current is a charge. You, if I construct on this current by taking the spatial integral, so if I'm working in D space time dimensions, this is in a D minus one dimensional um, spatial hypothesis of the time component of this, um, of this quantity, such that. The cost is zero. So this is a conserved charge. It's conserved in time, meaning it doesn't change in time. Okay, so this is Mervis theorem. The nice thing about Mervis theorem is that it doesn't tell us about the existence of the current. It tells us how to construct the current. So it's a constructive theorem. Okay, so what we're going to explore in the next lecture is. How do I construct the nervous current? I'll do some examples of actual construction of the nervous uh, current as well as uh, associated with the charge. Um, and then um, we will talk about what it means for a quantum system to obey nervous theorem. Um, and then we're going to spend some time, probably a bunch of next week, talking about. Um, Things like whether this construction is unique, so it's certainly an existence here, question is whether it's unique as well. We we'll find that the answer is no. And this no is going to be very important in the context of um, conformal field theory. That is because the associated current in the conformal field theory is something called the energy momentum tensor. So if anyone of you that has a GR or have done GR, that's the same energy momentum tensor that you're um, that we've seen already. It is the crucial conserved quantity in the system. Um, and the, the, the thing about it is that the conserved quantity that comes out of the serum is not the one we want in, um, in the formal field theory. So actually, 
meet the fact that the converted current is not unique. Okay. All right. So we'll pick up again on Friday.